Hello friends and uh, welcome to another WSIB Truth Matters with Joe Machado and our very first edition of the new segment to the channel Focus on WizYet. Um, I talked extensively about um, the reason for um, adding this new segment on Wednesday nights to the channel. Um, for those of you who didn't have a chance to watch that video, I recommend that you go back and watch it. It was my very last video. And for those of you who are new to the channel, welcome. And I also recommend that you watch my previous videos as well as the one talking about this new segment. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, um, I believe, and those of you who have been following along, um, I believe that uh, the uh, WSIB appeals branch should be dismantled. I don't believe that it is in the best interest of injured workers. And I provide detailed reasons for that in um, my prior video. And I really want to shine a, a light on the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal uh, because I believe that um, they are much better equipped to deal with um, injured worker appeals. And uh, I believe that uh, they are fair, that they apply the law, uh, the various WSIB legislations and policies. And I do believe that they do the best they can to render a fair decision for injured workers. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get everything you want or to have your appeal uh, granted. Uh, everything obviously has to be done within the law, but I do believe they are your best chance. The case that I'm going to talk about today, um, I, I refer to it as the 12 year nightmare. And, um, I'm sure that some of you are probably going through it right now or have at some point in time. And it's unfortunate, but um, you're going to see from this case that there is a, a vast contrast between how the WSIB decision makers and in the appeals branch um, apply the law and their policies and how the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal Vice Chairs uh, apply the law and WSIB policies. And uh, I believe that a, a number of, a significant number of cases should never end up at the tribunal if WSIB decision makers from appeals, uh, from case managers to appeals officers, um, if they were more zealous, thorough, uh, and intent on applying the law on a consistent basis. It would make things much easier for injured workers, but um, I don't believe that to be the case. And so in this particular case, this person had four tribunal appeals uh, to eventually get justice in her claim. And all of this took place over a period of 12 years. That's a long time. Um, and um, I believe it's highly discriminatory, but anyway, that's a discussion for another time. Um, the, uh, the, um, the details of the case that I'm about to talk about are pretty straightforward. Um, I'll put it up on the screen here. So the worker uh, began as an assembler with the employer in 2001. And in 2008, she was having issues with her right, uh, her right arm, uh, which she attributed to the repetitive duties involved in assembling uh, keyless entry uh, for, for cars. Uh, the WSIB did eventually grant an 8% non-economic loss award in March of 2011 to recognize the uh, permanent impairment in her right arm and of course, uh, restrictions that go along with it. Uh, where everything went downhill from there was in uh, September of 2011, the, uh, the, the employer closed the plant permanently. And um, she was all of a sudden out of work as of September 2011. Uh, she sought benefits from the WSIB, she sought support and they turned her down. Um, they pretty much denied work transition services 
and loss of earnings benefits and health care benefits for a condition that had been established for the right arm with recognized permanent impairment. It's amazing how they just arbitrarily um, ignore information that's, that's, that they've recognized themselves. So all of this resulted in a series of appeals. Um, she appealed the uh, WSIB's decision to deny work transition services, loss of earnings benefits and health care. Um, eventually, she went all the way to the tribunal. There was uh, an issue of um, missing an appeal time limit and she uh, sought an extension from the tribunal and that was denied, uh, unfortunately. But um, fortunately for her, she didn't quit. Um, she went on to, uh, to claim uh, additional um, benefits for treatment, which both the case manager and the appeals resolution officer denied with the recognized right shoulder prop or right arm disability that had an 8% now. They denied treatment. She went all the way to the tribunal with that appeal. This was her second appeal and the tribunal in a decision of June of 2014 um, granted additional treatment for her. As I said, this was the second decision. She then uh, requested entitlement for a left shoulder problem that she attributed to her right shoulder. She was obviously using the left shoulder to compensate for the problems with the right shoulder. The appalling fact of, of, of all of this is that there was documented evidence that the WSIB was aware of. Um, in 2010, this is before the plant closed down, that she was having these problems and they denied the uh, left arm all the way up to the tribunal and the tribunal uh, heard the case. This is the third appeal. And in that, in that decision uh, of November of 2020, so now we're uh, eight years after her injury. Um, it's just mind boggling. The tribunal granted entitlement to the left arm as a secondary condition. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the impact of that and all that was recognized at that hearing. Um, and then in, um, in a, a further appeal, this is the fourth appeal now, which went all the way to the tribunal, uh, where she applied for um, full LOE benefits, claiming that she was unemployable. And in June 18 of 2023, the tribunal uh, heard the appeal and uh, granted full LOE um, beyond um, September of 2021. So now we're at uh, 12 months uh, or 12 years after the plant closed down and her 12 year nightmare begins. So in the uh, the second tribunal appeal, the uh, she requested um, entitlement to health care benefits, as I indicated before, for treatment for her legitimate and accepted uh, impairment of the right arm, and they just they denied it, which is mind boggling. Uh, because I can't see any doctor that would recommend treatment for a patient unless they needed it. And yet, the WSIB, in their infinite wisdom, both at the case manager's level and the appeals level, decided that, no, you don't need any more treatment. We're not going to give it to you. They made that unilateral decision. 
disgusting. So um, she appealed that and they granted, the tribunal granted entitlement to additional treatment. And in fact, they confirmed that, that in that decision um, that, uh, and all of the decisions and the decision numbers will be posted so that you can review them yourself and, and go through it uh, because they are very interesting. Uh, I can't go into all of those details because obviously this would be a two hour video. So I'm just gonna talk about the highlights. But yeah, so um, they also noted in that decision that, um, that she had a significant permanent deterioration of her compensable right arm problem as, a, uh, uh, as of uh, September of 2012. So the tribunal was uh, well justified in granting additional benefits and in, in, grant, and in noting that in their decision about the, uh, the deterioration in the, in the right arm. But the most important decision in all of this is the one that came next, the third one, which was um, in November of 2020. And what the tribunal um, recognized in that decision is, is, is very important to just really highlighting how inefficient um, and incompetent board staff are when it comes to adjudicating these claims. And so the tribunal granted initial entitlement to the left arm as being, uh, or they, they granted secondary entitlement to the left arm as being part of the claim. They also, and they went back to October of 2020, 2010, which is before she um, was laid off permanently because the employer shut down. The significance of this, the significance in recognizing this secondary condition is that it allowed the tribunal to then make a determination as to what services and benefits would flow from having that secondary condition accepted in the claim which then basically overturns the uh, WSIB's decision to deny uh, work transition services when her employer closed down. Because now, as of October 10th, 2010, with recognizing the left uh, shoulder, the left arm as being related to the claim, um, the, the WSIB would have to, would be forced to look at entitlement for work transition services. So it was imperative that the tribunal accept entitlement for the left arm. And so as a result of that, they um, basically said, no, no, now you got to go back and provide work transition services. This is basically what they said to the board. And then they made another ruling uh, with respect to benefits, loss of, earning, loss of earnings benefits from the time that her employer permanently closed and the time that the WSIB implement that decision uh, and provide work trends and services and then determine what those work reintegration services are. And so in that uh, specific section of the uh, of the decision, the tribunal basically indicated that they didn't accept that she was totally impaired, uh, but they did say that she was capable of working 40 hours a week at minimum wage. So it would at least uh, compel the WSIB, or basically they've ordered the WSIB, to pay uh, a partial loss of earnings between her escalated pre-accident earnings at the time that her employer shut down and what, if any, work reintegration services are offered and provided after this implementation of the implementation of this decision. So that's also very important because that way 
she obviously would get some retroactive benefits. Um, the other important factor was that the, basically the tribunal ordered the WSIB to implement that portion of their decision and to continue to pay her um, full. So for the period that the decision was made, uh, July or November 2020, until the board had concluded work reintegration services, the tribunal ordered that they pay full LOE during that time. So partial LOE benefits between the time that the employer closed down and the date of the decision, November of 2020, and then full LOE from the date of the decision, November 2020, until the WSIB made a determination as to uh, the issue of work reintegration services. So all of these things could have been done by the WSIB and any competent, knowledgeable ARO um, because they were aware of her shoulder problems or her, they had accepted right arm problems with restrictions and a permanent impairment. They became aware of the problems with the left arm where they could have investigated that further. No different than what the, uh, the tribunal did. And all of that information was available in the file and medical reports were there to show that she was having these problems. Um, to provide work reintegration services when the plant closed down, all of this information was in the file that would have allowed a willing and experienced and competent appeals resolution officer to make decisions that are fair to the injured worker. And all of them are supported by law and various policies, as you'll see if you go and have a look at these decisions. So it's not like the tribunal plucked something out of the air um, to try and manufacture a decision to provide all of this entitlement. They don't do that. They look at evidence, they look at facts, they look at the law, they look at a policy, and then they put it all together. So this was all available within the WSIB. The fourth appeal. So the fourth appeal is the most recent one. And that's where the uh, after the conclusion of work transition sh uh, services in 2021, <clears throat> September of 2021, where the WSIB went again against medical reporting, vocational rehabilitation reporting. They went against that and deemed that she was capable of working 40 hours a week, full time, in their suitable employment or business. But again, they ignored crucial information in making that determination. And so I'm gonna put it up on the screen. This is what the vice chair looked at and used to make that determination. And so basically the, the vice chair in deciding that the worker was unemployable after work reintegration services were completed, basically considered this information. Assessing all of the evidence, I conclude that the worker has been rendered competitively unemployable as a result of the workplace injury. I find that the worker cooperated in the work transition services as required by decision number 470-20. That's the, the one that they allowed for work reintegration services. But that ultimately in conjunction with these services she was unemployable as of the closure of the work transition services. In arriving at this conclusion, I note that the worker has a 20% NEL award for organic injuries and has been out of the workforce for some time. She also has a psychotraumatic disability entitlement as of April of 2021. While the ARO found no return to work precautions from the psychotraumatic disability, I arrive at a different conclusion based on the January 4th 
2021 psychovocational assessment report and Dr. Clayton's subsequent reporting. In particular, Dr. Clayton's report dated March 16, 2022 is not contradicted before me. Thus, having regard to the worker's physical and functional limitations from her organic injuries rated at 20%, her psychotraumatic disability, including medical restrictions and limitations, her limited transferable skills, her age, I find that the worker was unable to find or sustain employment as of September 2021. Put another way, I find, and if necessary, infer, that the worker's compensable injuries contributed to her loss of earnings after September 2021, and that she's entitled to full LOE as of September 2021. So, Basically, you have a, a vice chair who looks at the totality of the information, uh, looks at the psychovocational assessment, which is a tool that's used by a case managers or return to work specialists uh, to attempt to identify uh, suitable uh, occupations. Um, so this is one of the tools that they use. They ignored that report, uh, both the case manager and the IRO. Uh, they ignored the recommendations in that report and basically said, you know what? We think you can go to work at 40 hours a week doing this, blah, 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 and we're going to cut you off, forcing yet another appeal, four appeals. So the conclusion that, that I derive from this charade, this monumentous, or monumental um, shitstorm created by the WSIB. The the uh, egregious neglect um, that they have displayed. In, at every stage in making decisions, uh, just beyond appalling, forcing this person to go through 12 years of appeal after appeal after appeal, having to contend with not having financial support, not having the treatment that she needs. And all of it, except for that one missed appeal time on the decision. But having been overturned is just horrendous. So there you go, friends. Just one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I have, I believe that there is absolutely no use um, and no purpose or useful purpose for the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals or the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board's appeals branch to exist because I believe that all it does is just cause delays. Um, they ignore their own policies in the law. They ignore crucial information in a worker's file and provide decisions that contradict all of the factual and evidence information that is um, in, the, in the file. So, uh, friends, uh, if you're interested and um, you want to learn more of the details and the specifics of each and one of those decisions, uh, they will be posted on the, in the description so you can have a look. Um, but yes, so this concludes the very first episode of uh, the, um, the new added segment to the channel that will be taking place on Wednesday nights. Um, and there's a lot more to come. Uh, and so please share my videos with others. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are probably in similar circumstances to this person. Um, and by being able to go through some of the decisions, um, and that might be helpful for them in their appeal. Uh, or uh, if anything, uh, just uh, uh, they can also be introduced to my other videos and uh, my company WSIBSettlements.com and all of the tools that I've created there to help injured workers with their WSIB claims. All right, friends, so uh, look forward to, uh, to doing another video for you uh, coming up uh, tomorrow, uh, my regular week, uh, weekly videos and another segment, um, episode number two of Focus on Wisiac will be coming out uh, next Wednesday. 
All right, friends, as always, take care.